So, okay. Thank you, first of all, for being here and congratulations on all of your success and creation since. Thank you, Mui. Thank you for having me. My of pleasure. Course. Yes, of course. And let, me, and let me correct that I'm just a producer, writer. I, am, I didn't direct the film. Oh, blessings. Thank you for that correction. Big yeah. Modi directed the film. Yes, Obira Puya. Yes, blessings. Thank you so much for that correction. Um, but I also want to um, thank you um, for inspiring this movement and um, for all filmmakers like myself um, and continuing to create. So um, before we get into all of the clips and the scenes that we're going to see from this incredible film, um, Living in Bondage, I wanted you to speak more about um, the culture um, in the early 90s Nigeria and how Living in Bondage was able to be created. Um, what was the process like from pre-production, post and creation? Okay, I think I'll go a little way bit, um, back to a little bit of the history before living in bondage. You know that Nigeria used to have um, quite a robust film going culture in the 60s and in the early 70s. Um, but um, uh, by 72, after the war, 1972 and 75, the federal government of um, uh, General Obasanjo at that moment. Um, promulgated a decree called the Indigenization Decree. That particular decree was meant to divest most of the multinational companies' shares, you know, to give more access to local um, 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 people. So that meant that most of the filmmaking um, companies that were, you know, distributing in Nigeria had to leave. And at that moment, Nigerians were not, Nigeria was just one of those um, chains of distribution for the big fives, you know, the MGMs and the Wena Bros of, those war, of this world. Mm -hmm. They were the ones making films and they had cinema chains across the nation, east, mm -hmm. west, north, and south. So, but when this decree came, they had to leave. And they left big warehouses, big cinemas with little or no know-how for the locals to manage these cinemas. So it was a little bit of time before um, these cinemas began to nose dive um, because when our uh, these big five traveled back to the to, to, to their countries, they short circuited Nigeria. They made sure that the product they were making couldn't come to Nigeria. So meaning that cinemas were not serviced, they were oh, wow. empty. Yeah, no content. So our local producers, for instance, the likes of Ali Balu, Edu uh, um, Goma. Uh, Paul Gunde, um, Ade Love, uh, Brendan Shehu, they were making films, trying to fill up the gap, but they were making it, they were not making enough. So what that meant was that it created a vacuum for unscrupulous pirates to begin to think of how to um, manage this crisis. So they will now travel to the Western world and buy new releases. They will bring them back here and drop them into... Um, cassettes, pirate them into cassettes and sell them to the market for people to buy. So that was how the industry died. Light was epileptic, infrastructure began to decay. Eventually, churches began to buy up those big cinemas. And by the time we came to the scene, there were no platforms for us to make films because there were no platforms for us to distribute them. So what that meant was that someone must either rejig or recalibrate the way the industry is practiced. Otherwise, we we'll die unemployed. It was at that moment that it came to occur to me that we can actually tell stories using an ordinary VHS camera. Yes, the quality may not be the same thing, like the big gauge. It's not going to be near a cine camera at all. But the idea was for us to create something to put a little bit, keep us busy while we're waiting for the almighty cine, uh, uh, celluloid and cinema to come back. We didn't know how long it would take, but I wasn't going to die with my dreams. So I decided that we must make a film, but um, because when we were in school, we were taught that the storytelling quality of a camera is the same thing. Whether it is big quality or little quality, when you look at a picture, you will know what it's saying. So. What we did was to reject the practice of filmmaking from celluloid, from the almighty celluloid, to an ordinary handheld digital camera that can be so pocket friendly and all inclusive so that you and I can make films today. 
if we depended on the big structured studios to commission me, I and you to make films, we will, we will be out of business. So, but this was what we did to demystify celluloid. Now we now began to say everybody can make a film. Now, your question was, what was it like pre-production up to the production level and then the marketing? So when this idea occurred to me, the first thing that was my confronted me was that there was no money. I mean, celluloid was huge money if you wanted to make celluloid. Now that I wanted to make a little film, my budget then was 150,000 naira, which is equivalent of a little bit above $2,000 today. I'm sorry, you said Nigeria. a bit of $200, yes. like $200, you said? A little, a little bit, at, at the exchange rate of Nigeria today, which is 700 uh, naira per dollar, it will be about $2,000. $200. Oh, wow. <laughs> as little as that. Yeah. But in those, in those days, in 1992, it will be, um, because the, dollar, the Naira was a little bit higher then, it will be about $15,000 then. But I was on the streets trying to raise that money. Every door I knocked with this idea, nobody opened. Mm -hmm. I didn't come from a very rich family. My parents were teachers. So they couldn't give me the money. I didn't have collateral to go to banks to borrow money. And even if I had collateral, banks didn't believe in filmmaking because it wasn't even a practice then. It wasn't lucrative. Mm -hmm. So what was I going to do? I decided that I was going to go to the streets of Lagos to hawk. There was no employment. There was an embargo employment. And so the only session that could have absorbed us as students, uh, as a graduate, was only NTA, Nigerian Television Authority. And there was an embargo of employment. They couldn't take us in. So I did that job of hawking, selling ways on the streets for four years just to raise 150,000 naira. And it wasn't possible. So, luckily for me, God helped me. Somebody gave me a referral, a letter to Chief Kenneth Neville, who was one of the people, merchants in the market, um, selling pirated movies those days. So they will travel to Japan, bring in tapes, then travel to Europe or America and bring in one new release and they dub the tapes into the new release, the re new release into the tapes and sell into the market so that people can begin to watch films again. So when I saw that practice and I said, it's better for us to take cinema to the homes of people instead of taking people to the cinema that were non-existent. So that was how Kenneth Nebo um, looked at me asked me questions about what I wanted to do. And I told him the story about living in bondage, which was actually an experience I had um, when I worked briefly somewhere under my promotion. And then it was, um, this story was actually, um, sometime while I was working briefly with Mike, as he said, uh, by the way, Mark is Chief Michael Obala, who was the only uh, African wrestling champion that Nigeria produced. He's, he's late now. So I worked with him briefly after school, after graduation, just to follow him to cover a few fights. So, but he retired early and I, I was on the streets again. During the few moments we were working with him, there was this cultural festival, so-called cultural festival that I was engaged to go and cover, you know, to go and record. And I went for that recording. It was everything I saw in that recording that gave me the idea to make a film called Living in Bondage. Because I saw what they touted to be a cultural festival, it looked like it, but it was actually an initiation for some occultic people. And so when I left that place, um, I said that I must document this for the world to see, that there is this rumor we were hearing that people are into occultic practices just to make money, that it is real. Mm -hmm. So I now began to put some elements of creativity into the true story in order to give it a flesh that it turned out today to be something phenomenal. And so um, when Kenneth gave the money, of course, I told him I wasn't going to make the, the film with an ordinary VHS machine. I needed a super VHS, a little bit higher than VHS. So he went and bought a super VHS for me. And I, this was the first time an Igbo film would be made. Um, well, it may not be professional, because there were some people who were making some 
some slapstick here and there, but it wasn't it wasn't um, made into films as it ought to be. So I needed now to go get people who can speak this language that can interpret my script. Right. So so I that one took another time because remember we're in the city. It's a potpourri of different languages. So before you can narrow down on artists that can speak your language, it took some time. But I was able to go back to the National Theater in order to bring in some people. And through some referrals also, we gathered ourselves and then did some um, tight rehearsals for, for 21 days and then went into the field to shoot. Oh, wow. Um, yes, yes. So, and then... Um, uh, we shot the movie. Um, a lot of obstacles, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of uh, because it's not been done like that before. I <laughs> went to NTA to go and bring in the director, Mr. Chris Obirapu. His um, um, pen name then was Chris Mordi. So he directed the movie with me. Of course, Chris taught me in school, in film school. So I knew his capabilities. So when I was bringing him in, and then um, we made the film. Um, Kenneth also sold the film. He funded the film and he distributed the film. And then today, that meeting with Kenneth and uh, working with uh, Chris Modi, uh, Rappo, is what is giving us has given us this industry that um, is now almost like a phenomenon all over the world called uh, Nollywood. Yes. And then here, here am I. <laughs> yes, here we are. Yes, thank you. That story was incredible. And there are so many like little nuggets that I can take from it. But um, one of the most beautiful aspects and stories that I can hear from it is this idea of innovation um, and your dedication to continuing to tell this story um, and learning all that you could and taking each step um, in order to um, get as much money because I don't care who you are in cinema, you need money to make films. So the mm -hmm. fact that you said, I'm going to hit the streets and work and knock on doors and continue and continue in order to create, that is that is incredible. And I commend you and thank you again. Thank you. That's thank you, my pleasure. Yes, of course. That is so beautiful. I do want to get into the scenes that we have rolled up so that people can okay. understand more about um, living in bondage. Um, of course, I've seen them already, so I have more questions about Igbo culture and how it's displayed in the film. But um, our first scene that we're going to get into um, is actually a setup for a decision where our protagonist, um, he's going to run into an old friend um, who is visiting, and the old friend's name is Paolo. And we learned that Paolo is doing very well. He is riding around in his Mercedes Benz while Andy, our protagonist, is walking and also still smiling. But once he sees what Paolo has, he begins to want more and talks about what's happening in his life and um, how he's not as well off. So I would love to roll this next clip um, in order to start talking about it. Okay. 
uno de mapebiro so so fife ke tatambo andi okeke de tu o nya gi ne kalu mo ye mun ah o mi andi elego mi o bolo na na kwa ma ga no ti ji e mi ne ga adoko pe ye bo mo na mo e jo ki ku mo e ki I was there. I'm a professional bachelor. I want you to do that. Tomorrow. Hello. You know, mama. I can't So, it's not giving me a Because if you buy, never going to Okay, what is the problem? No, it's fine. Get it out of Yes. Anyway, I thought I'd go to when I go to the Hey. And, um, okay, I'm going to go in and go to the shop. I'm going to go buy it. Well, <laughs> Go to my way, see here. Eh? Come on, no, if you get come. No, you can't. Hey, Paul, eh? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do more than to take you. Eh? I'm going to be more than you. I'm going to go with 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 you. Okay, <laughs> 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 Given the Niger, eh? This Saturday night, a friend of mine, Ikea, million. In fact, it's a million. Only a man, but the party, Saturday night. I love my turkey, the Jenny. Call a wild Jessia, eh? If we didn't know, I like to be as a young man, Kata. Give my name, I never know. <laughs> How do you like it? <laughs> uh, that's the real, the British um, wine, and I hope you I like the taste. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Oh no, move on. Ma, Anna, and you don't know family planning. I said family planning, I said again. Oh, when it will be said, you know, Yasmin. Yasmin. You may give the wine. 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 I found a moon, I know I even go for no if I. And I get to come now. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I like this scene a lot. Obviously the conversation that is expressed in the scene, um, I think it presents the setting well, it sets the tone, but it also reveals a bit culturally about the area um, because Andy is able to rearrange his entire day on a whim after running into his old friend. Um, so not only that, he ended up confiding him. And naturally for me, it brought up some like red flags. Like, wait, hold on, why is he telling this, this man his whole life story? Like, you know, when you're in front of new people, you always wanna look really tough and strong and things like that, but he's confiding him. And I think that it spoke to this comfort and trustworthiness and familiarity um, between Paolo and Andy, um, very well done. Um, in the script writing for that. So I wanted to ask about um, um, the inspiration for this dialogue and the connection between Paolo and Andy. Okay, fine. Um, let me start by telling you that 
this same dialogue you see here, almost exactly, although I just embellish it here and there, there was a young man who gave me the job. Um, you remember I mentioned about a, 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 a cultural festival I went to cover. There was yeah. a young man who gave me the job. When I was squat, squatting in Ajegule, downtown Ajegule, one of the suburbs in Lagos, looking for job, this young man told me um, that he has a group of people who is a, into a cultural group that help each other, that uh, he can take me there to cover the event. Right. And every money I needed to make a film as a filmmaker, that, that group will provide it for me. So I charged them some money, quite some good money, and went and covered that event for them. After the event, I was not asking him. what He first asked me, what, how do I like the place? That I, honestly, I love the people I saw there because they were rich. <laughs> Men and women, boys and girls, they were all rich. Each of right. them would drive in in big cars, wearing good regalia. But they would then enter into a place and then they would change into some other costume like um, just an ordinary wrapper, white wrapper or red or black, depending on their ranks. From their torsos down, um, they will wrap up themselves and each of them will come. And everybody was a leveler. Everybody was equal in the, in, the, in the conference. So I was fascinated. But I noticed that they were honoring somebody, one young lady, very fair and fine, beautiful. And so the news that I got that day was that the young lady um, worked so hard for the organization that he converted somebody who was a reverend father to leave, to join them. So I was shocked. I said, what can a reverend father be doing in a cultural setting like this? But for that reason, she was being honored. So when we left the place and the guy asked me if I loved what I saw there, I said, yes. So I, yeah. I now asked him, by the way, what is the name of this organization, this group? So he mentioned the name. It was the name of a popular cult that everyone in the East know that they are into ritual killings. Well, I may not say ritual killing, into rituals. They, mm -hmm. they, they make rituals in order to have money, to be rich. Okay. So my, my blood ran cold. I said, so this is the group you want me to join. My parents will not hear of this. My <laughs> conscience will not even allow me to join yeah. this. Yes. I said, why should I? So he persuaded me. He began to persuade me, just like mm -hmm. I was persuading Andy. He gave me a lot of reasons why I should join them a lot of reasons why I don't have to fear anything. If I was talking about God and conscience, he said, no, those things don't even matter. You know, he was just very persuasive. But at the end of the day, he couldn't persuade me because mm -hmm. I am coming from a family with a very strong father. Yes. Strong families with strong parents bring up children with strong values. Mm -hmm. And when your values are very strong, when you are let loose on the streets of any city in the world, because the city and the world system is almost like an ocean, if your values, which is supposed to be your anchor to life, is not strong enough, when you find yourself into the sea of the world system, your anchor will break, your values will degenerate, and you will be drowned by the stronger values out there. That's the message I was trying to bring up. And so when we... When I met Andy, when I was writing this story, my that's why I played that role. Because I was going to be that persuasive. I didn't think that I could find someone who can paint <laughs> the words, the pictures, the way I will paint them. And again, I am very strong in, in, in spoken language, Igbo language, which is why sometimes it appeared that I have some accent and I accept it. I'm not an Igbo, you know. So I, I can speak in dialogues in Igbo, I can speak with every idiomatic expressions and I will understand them because I live with elders. So I took that and I wrote all of that into the script. So you find that when Andy met, when I met Andy, remember these are old friends. We were friends when we were in secondary school. So it means that those are actually the friends you really, really do have. Yes. And we bond, yes, and we bonded that time when we were nobodies, when we didn't have anything to hide. So meeting him after so many years today, it looks like we didn't lose any time. I love it was that. Just I... Like, 
a reunion. So Andy is easy and open to open up to me, to tell me all he's going through, because if there's any friend who will help him, it will be me. Mm -hmm. And you remember, um, I helped him really, because that's all I know. What I'm doing, I didn't give him what I don't have. It's what I have that I give him. We appreciate the authentication of all of this information. Um, I do have another question, but I just want to um, I just want to move on to the next clip because I do have another question that's going to connect with what you were talking okay. about about culture and evil culture. Um, okay. So okay. in this next scene, of course, um, we're actually going to see Andy. We're going to see Andy um, as he's complaining and lamenting to his wife um, about wanting to buy her nice things and considering the option that Paolo presented to him. So I would love to see this next clip. Let's see what the problem is. And maybe I look at what one you know Tony and I shine in a month or touch like put me in me. Hey, Well, 
Awesome. So now I want to have an opportunity to speak about um, Igbo culture and culturally, um, because Nigerian cinema, it's seen on such a global scale. And we do see the introduction of these tropes of like money, success, um, men and women, um, the family dynamic, um, and this idea of African solidarity versus this Western in introduction to colonial individualism, which is what I see Andy as seeking. Um, so I wanted to ask about how you feel about these tropes and how they're beneficial in creating a national identity, if they are beneficial. Well, um, you see, I think one of the reasons why Nollywood films are well received internationally is because of the values. African values are still very, very pristine, very, very uh, preserved. Um, you can imagine uh, Merit now complaining about Andy to the sister-in-law. And it's not an offense because in, the, in our own setting, the Igbo culture, one person does not own a child. Neither does one person marry a wife. If you're married into a family, everyone in that family is your husband, except in the bedroom. Every person has it. They can care for you. They can advise you. They can rebuke you. They can give you gifts and without any strings attached. And that community life that Africans are known for is also what I think our films are packaging and giving. Because remember, filmmaking is all about packaging and presenting the cultural tones of a people to a global audience with sound and picture. That's all. So now you've seen what is going on. Well, first and foremost, Andy had a friend who wants to help him. And the, uh, this scene you played now, you, you find out that somebody left that scene. It's called Rob. He came to bring a business to Andy. It's all about friendships. It's all about family. It's all about relationships. Because relationship is actually the currency of the spirits. If you don't have good relationships, you don't have money. It is the number of people you have in your network, which is what we're calling network today. Mm -hmm. That is, is, is how prosperous you can be in life. So, but Western culture talks about individualism, where people, even when your next door neighbor is hungry, you, you don't care. You, you may not even know him from year to year. But in Africa, everybody is a brother's keeper. And everybody's business is everybody's business. You cannot say, this is my own boundary. Don't cross into it. Everybody will cross into your boundary. So now, if we can foster, yes, um, cultural imperialism has eroded part of that from us. But it, what we're doing with Nollywood is to try and see if we can re continue to repackage this and refresh our memories to who we are so that we can build a cultural denizance that talks about the African values. The stronger our values are, the stronger we can remain together and the stronger we can prosper in life. Yes. 
Absolutely. I love this theme of African solidarity. And I think that it definitely plays out um, as Andy makes his decisions. It's always based on his morality and what he believes and the yeah. people he's connected with and how it affects those people. And we're actually going but to Andy, see Andy is a very greedy person. Which yes, is something yes. That you, yes, yes, because this is somebody who is covetous. He wants to aspire to be like every other person. And the mm -hmm. moment people step out from who they are, and what they have because of covetousness, greed sets in. And what you find out is that they will never really concentrate on who they are. They'll be looking outside. And yeah. what it means is that they're only headed towards a precipice. And that's what Andy ended up with. Ultimately, Andy forgot that he has a good wife, a good family, yes. good, good friends. He didn't think about them at all. He was counting on money. He was counting on how many cars others have. He forgets that time and seasons of individuals are different. Just like nations in America, they, you have different seasons. Autumn, you have uh, summer, you have winter, different seasons. No two persons have the same seasons. My timing is different from yours and yours is different from mine. The moment we can take away our eyes from greed and covetousness and focus on our inherent talents and our own seasons and times, mm -hmm. we'll be happy. And then yeah. things will work out well for us. But I <laughs> didn't have all those. And he paid daily for it. That sounds so, so simple to focus on ourselves um, because that's one of the things I, I've picked out from Andy as well, because when he first met up with Paolo, he said, I have one thing to boast about, and that is my great wife. Woohoo. And then in the next scene we're about to see, um, I'm sure everyone will see, he is looking into these other women and his, the like other people at the party. And he's not sad until he sees what other people have. And it's mm. hit, when he's with his wife and with his auntie, he's like, I love it here. I'm so grateful to have my community that I have, but stepping out yeah. and not appreciating your seasons, as you put, um, yeah. that's, that's what puts him in bad, in a bad space. So I'm absolutely ready to play the next clip so that everyone can see um, where Paolo introduces Andy to another opportunity. Um, and I'm actually going to play that, that clip um, and then the following scene, which is the spiritual sacrifice, where we are introduced to the cult so we can see those both together and ask questions about that, okay? You all can play that clip. Thank you. <laughs> And the was <laughs> What to pass to We go to to each of them. How many you to I have power over women. I have I 
on a fait pour le fait pour le fait pour le fait le fait pour 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 le Great. So um, as I mentioned before um, about this scene um, and as OK um, reiterated, it's really interesting that Andy has the opportunity to look at everyone and where he is at this party with a bunch of millionaires and then decides, you know what, my life is not great. I want to be part of them instead of this conversation that we saw in the clip previously with his wife and his auntie about really loving where you are and having a really good wife who is supporting him. Like, I don't need all of these cars and things you say you want to buy me. I'm okay without that. Um, I think it's really beautiful to see him in these two different spaces. Um, and it introduces this idea of individualism and how he values it. Um, and the lengths in which he would go, because we're going to see in this next scene, the cult scene, the spiritual sacrifice, it is extremely intense. And I will say that my jaw dropped um, and it also introduces this idea of satire, um, which I will speak about after um, we view the clip. Okay, did you want to say anything about this clip before we start? Before we start? Uh, no, no, let's watch and then um, we'll talk. Okay, perfect. Andy, 
Andi, ubwa, wakena hii oni huna ya karisi ya, oni ni yangu, oni si hii, osno bumi ni ya kwa huna ya karisi ya. Echi, ega bonya hii huna ya karisi ya bumi yegi, biama kajanki bazo.
Chene fedin sabu li sifa. Ayo moru ge. Narya ge. Maka moru ge bu andyo keke. We narya se. Ki go siya hini le o kusere ho. Mame o kwa ka hini le zuko. Na le ze ge. No ge bazo. We neri mana ango. Maka no bo yemwe ye odida. Nini la kari oge. We mwen ka siyo bini ge mesura ye. Like I said, my jaw dropped during that scene because I was not expecting any of it. Um, but as you mentioned during your experience, um, these were real conversations. Um, and because I am here um, in the United States and seeing this film for the first time, I feel that it was more of a satire and an exaggeration um, and a statement on the effects of colonialism in, in society. And I feel like a lot of African cinema, thanks to Usman Sembeni, um, is satire and speaking to this, um, to, speaking to society. So I wanted you to speak on um, the power of media in creating this dialogue between the continent and the rest of the world. Now, you know, what you saw there um, is actually there are different dimensions of um, of calls that we decided to speak to. Like you said, it's a satire um, using Andy and the family, but there are elements of truth in that that we wanted to communicate to people so that they can um, refrain from you know stepping out of terms. That particular scene you saw was shot on the streets on a major road in the night about 12 midnight that was not that's that one wasn't in a hall it was an open space that's why you can hear the crickets and the different insects those things were not special effects they were real we couldn't find a place and we have not been to any part so we don't know how it looks and that board there was the table you saw there is a is a table with shaped like this like a coffin you know, so because we were just thinking, our mind was just racing creatively to say, what is it that this pulse look like so that we can replicate? <laughs> so we managed to hire some mats and other things in order to, you know, build set. It was actually the ingenuity of my, of my director who said, let's take this one on the road. I mean, since we can't find a place. So, you know, creating dialogues that connects our soul, the soul of Africa to the rest of the world is what actually doing. Creating scenarios, scenes, creative um, dialogues that speaks to um, values, that speaks to uh, prophetically, um, you know, say these are boundaries you must not cross. I mean, you can imagine um, upon how good Andy's wife was in this thing. Andy's wife eventually died. Andy tried everything she, he could to save this woman by bringing a halo. This, this thing is, is a portrait of a lot of values. Andy went on the street and, and got a halo and brought the halo in place of the wife. But the, the courts rejected her. Not because we wanted to, but because the woman had the guts the inspiration to shout the name of Jesus in the COVID. And everybody said, 
Whoa, this is a Christian. He must be left alone. But when Andy's wife got there, as good as she was, she couldn't even remember the name of God. She couldn't even remember. Her whole trust and confidence was in the husband. So she followed him like a sheep to the slaughter and died there. You know, so sometimes we think that loyalty can be unquestionable. Sometimes we, we think that we need to question loyalty because sometimes you do not know when the heart of a man or the heart of a partner changes and he, he begins to lead you into the abyss. So I, I, I don't know if um, this is answering some of your question, but I, I think I strongly believe that what we did with this team was to connect the youths, especially the young ones who are about to step into the place where life will begin to confront them so that they will know how to place their values in anywhere on the table before they can make choices. Because once there's a choice and the consequence must come, if that choice is good, good consequence comes. If that choice is bad, bad consequence comes. And that's what we did with this team. And I'm sure um, that's why it's resonating with a lot of people. Yes, yes. It was absolutely a tale of caution. Um, and I think that it did tell the story of temptation and putting these things in front of you when um, Paolo and um, Andy were speaking on the couch. When he was looking at all the millionaires, there was a cut to the chicken on the plate. It was a very close shot. And I was like, <laughs> am I hungry? <laughs> so I think that it really introduces these themes of temptation, because as you get over older and start navigating the world, you are going to be introduced with things that appear to be quick fixes. So yes. um, it's important to understand your values and remember what you do have at home and celebrate your seasons. And I think True. that this film really expresses that, the consequences that happen if you choose not to do that. Yes. Yes. True. Very true, very true. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for this conversation. I believe we have one more clip to see, um, and this is Andy's reaction. Um, to being prepared to sign papers and um, his wife appears to him. So please check out this next clip, everyone. Chief, Chief, okay, Chief, 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 Chief,
I genuinely feel that was a perfect ending to this story simply because he goes mad at the end. You can't just take someone's life and there are no consequences. And very often we are seeing these stories that do not depict what the outcome is. It's just a quick success story and you are allowed to live this life putting mm -hmm. other people down. And I, I'm very grateful that you ended the story like this and continued to tell the story. Thank you so much. You Thank you so much. Absolutely. Is uh, there anything that you wanted to say about this closing, about a moral? Yes. Uh, um, the, the greatest lesson here is that um, good will always triumph over evil. Amen. No matter how, there's no short part in life. The shortest cut to anything is actually the longest shot. It doesn't matter how you try to cut corners you will always get back to that same place you are trying to avoid. Like I said before, chances come, they come with choices. The choice is also determine the consequences we bear in life. Andy is a man of conscience. Mm -hmm. And conscience, according to Otman Dampodio, is an open wound. Mm. And only the truth can heal it. Conscience is an open wound. Except the truth, nothing heals it. And to sum it up, there is one Igbo proverb that says, when the rat falls, when the lizard falls into the water, it comes out dry. But when the rat joins him, follows him and emulates the, 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 the lizard and joins and, and runs into the water, it comes out wet. Now, mm -hmm. it means that it's one thing to emulate others and join them in what they're doing. But you may not have you are not wired the same way. You don't have the same DNA, the same attributes, the same character, the same heart condition to accommodate the type of evil they can accommodate. Evil is not good for anyone. But some people have feared their own consciences that they are, they are already dead, but are walking around as human beings. If you follow such people, they only lead to an untimely death. Mm -hmm. so that, 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 that's a little package. And it was for, I was speaking to myself. Because this is why I didn't join the occult. This is why I didn't join crime. This is why I stayed on the streets of Lagos for four years to hawk instead of going to do drugs or do uh, 419 and join all, all get peak, rich peak syndrome that is everywhere. Uh, I, because I remember what my father would tell us when we were young. Yeah. He says, not only, not only remember the son of whom you are, but he said that dignity in labor. Anything you can do to provide for yourself without stealing, without crime. There is dignity in it. Do it. Don't emulate others. And that's how I, what I would say to that clip. And Andy paid for the price. Nobody, nobody, whatever a man sows, he reaps it. And so, and that's what I, Andy has, um, is reaping his own. Um, and, and, and I don't pity him. Yes.
Blessings. Well, I'm so glad that you are here and you took the journey that you did take and that you were able to tell this story. Um, we are actually going to wrap up right now. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, OK. My, my, my name, of course, yes, of course. My name is Muyi Ali. This has been Plus 234 Connect Festival. It is presented by the National Museum of African Art. And we are hosting events and classes, masterclasses from September 28th to October 2nd. So make sure that you check it out. This has been a talk with producer OK Ogun Giofa on living in bondage. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Marie. Thank yes. you. Thank you, everyone.